Hello, I'm Kristen Oaks White and I'm Avery Davidson. Thank you for joining us for this week in Louisiana agriculture. The only TV show bringing Louisiana farmers and consumers together every week. $84 million a year. That's how much Louisiana alligator farmers make from selling every part of the alligator. But what they do to protect the species in the wild is priceless. In Livingston Parish, there's a place you could drive by and never even notice called C&M Gator Farm that releases more than 3,000 alligators back into the wild every year. That's the sound of new life hatched with a little help. Kristen Wall works with her family at C&M Gator Farm in Livingston Parish. For 63 days, the eggs have been in this room, an incubator where the temperature is monitored closely. And there's a very good reason why Wall keeps her eye on the thermometer. If we can collect the eggs early enough um, in the process from when they're laid and we bring them back to the farm, we can actually control the sex of the gator um, based off of the temperature which we keep the incubator. So if it is kept at 85 degrees, um, the turnout will be 80% females. And if it's kept at 90 degrees, the turnout will be 80% males. So we like to keep it in the middle um, for whenever we return them back into the wild. It needs to be kind of split sex. That way it, uh, the gators can reproduce in the wild and we can continue to do this. Mid-August begins a three-week hatching period when Wall and her family remove about 35,000 baby alligators from their shells and to begin another year of alligator farming. They're raised here in these barns. They're fed twice a day. They're fed real, real well compared to the wild. So they'll grow at, on this farm. They'll grow three times faster here than they would in the wild. This is about how big they are when it's time to harvest, about four feet long. The red tape is around their mouths for my protection, so it's not used when they're in these barns. Hey, that was my windscreen. After harvest, the walls bring the skins into this room and cover them in salt where they sit for at least 24 hours before being packed and shipped to a tannery. But here's the really cool part about what CNM Gator Farm does. Every year, they release about 3,500 alligators back into the wild. When alligators lay their eggs in the wild, they're vulnerable to predators, bad weather, and flooding. Wall says on average, only 10% of alligators hatched in the wild survive to adulthood. When we go and collect them and bring them back here to a safe place, we are saving so many gators. And then we're growing them to a size to where they can be released back into the wild and able, they're able to fend for themselves. Like Kristen said before the story, every part of the gator is sold and used. The heads and feet are used to make collectibles. The meat is tasty, especially when you get it blackened from your favorite restaurant. And even the innards, while quite disgusting, have a use. So I was really surprised by that, that, you know, we know that with cattle, yeah. everything is used. We know that with pork, everything is used. To find out that everything is used with, with the alligators as well, and that they even have to grow them a certain length based on what folks are looking for. Well, you know what I'm going to ask you is, mm -hmm. what did you bring me back? And this would have been something that I really would like to see a souvenir from. Well, there was no Chanel purse there. In fact, Chanel is no Boots. longer, you know, no, no, none of that. Felt. I thought about bringing you a baby alligator, but then you'd have had to feed it and no, you'd have gotten attached. That, yeah. That would have been bad. You Next would. time though, baby alligator. <laughs> Whenever you get a new car, it's normal to feel a buzz of excitement. The smell, the handling, the new features. Well, one car in St. Mary Parish has some features that seem like a bug. We sent our brave reporter Neil Malance on to see if he could feel the sting of excitement. Hey everybody, with me is Jude Verrett. He is a, both a beekeeper, you're a farmer, an exterminator. You do a lot, don't you? Yes, I do. <laughs> he does. <laughs> and uh, we're, I'm back with him once again because I didn't learn my lesson about yellow jackets the last time. Right over behind me, the Chevy Malibu is actually one big yellow jacket nest. Is that right? Correct. And uh, how did you find out about this? I was getting my uh, truck service and uh, I gave the guy my business card and he said, you're the bee guy? And uh, I'm like, yeah. He says, the neighbor's got a uh, beehive in a car. He showed me a picture. I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a lost nest. And that's, uh, <laughs> I mean, they are full in there, as you're going to see. He's already done some videos that have gone viral. You've gotten, what, 300,000 views so far on it? It's, it's yeah, hard to say. Yeah, on YouTube, 300,000. Wow. Yes. 
And so we're going to get in there and take a look and, and see what they are. So we're going to get suited up and, uh, and go take a look. Now, you might remember from the last time I worked with Jude that I got stung when a yellow jacket crawled down my glove. Ow. This time, I'm taking extra precautions, including another pair of socks and... This is an extreme nest, what some people would call a super, a super colony. Okay. So we're going to put two suits on you. Or, oh, wow. Yeah, we're going to double you up. Jude also gave me a face protector. Look, guys, I'm a ninja. And some of his very own homemade gloves, which I make sure to pull all the way up. Now, Jude, one of the things I want to talk to you about is yellow jackets have a reputation of being very ferocious, but they're not super aggressive unless you mess with the nest. Is that right? Correct. If you respect them, they'll respect you. As long as you don't bump the nest, breathe directly on them, but make a vibration, they typically will leave you alone. So unless you touch the nest, if you have one on your property that's, you know, not near your normal paths, it's fine to leave them alone. They won't come after you. Correct. 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 All right. Well, let's go mess with them. As we approach the car, it becomes obvious the nest has grown from when he got it two weeks ago. That entrance is on the driver's side, right where I'm going to be sitting. Let's take a, let's I would, take a when drive. When you open the door, I'd go quick. Okay. That way you're not sitting on too many of them. Got it. Here we go. Wow. Well, the smell has gotten a lot stronger. And uh, one just stung me uh, Where right at? on my knee. So. On your knee? Yep. Right on this side. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. It'll swell up. That's fine. Oh, one just stung me on the back. All right. <laughs> so, yeah, this is not the Uber car I called for. These passengers are pretty crazy. Let's go. So walk, walk through the tree, Daniel. Well, I didn't get stung once at least. It was more like six or seven times. Jude tells me to get away, which takes quite some time. They're still on me. I've walked uh, a good uh, 200 feet. They're still buzzing around me. I still, still hear them. So I finally got away from those yellow jackets and I got stung a few times, but it was worth it because uh, it was just good to see that many. And, uh, but if you have a problem like that with yellow jackets or bees or anything, you can call Jude Barrett, Stinger Exterminating at uh, his number. Now, one of the things, Jude, is that you're an exterminator, but you really try not to exterminate as many of these hives, whether they be yellow jackets or bees. Tell me why. Um, they're beneficial insects. Honeybees are obviously, everybody knows they're beneficial. Um, I had these old gardeners like, hey, uh, I don't have bees on my cucumbers, on my peppers, on uh, my tomatoes. Bees typically don't pollinate those crops because the sugar content of, the, uh, of the, the flower, the nectar, is not there. They're gonna go to something that has a higher sugar content. So you're relying on your wasps, your, bee, your, your bumblebees, and your yellow jackets to pollinate those. So if you have those garden crops, if you have a garden that you like keeping pollinated to keep those fresh vegetables around, keep those yellow jackets nearby, but not too close, so long as you don't mess with the nest, because having messed with one and gotten stung now six, seven times, uh, I can tell you it's better to be hot in August in this bee suit than, than being stung. For this week in Louisiana agriculture, I'm getting ready to go home and get some leave. I'm Neil Malawson. Well, I hate to say I'm glad it was you and not me and Hill, but I do hope those stings heal quickly. By the way, Jude Verrett estimates his insect removal videos have garnered half a billion views worldwide. You can see more of his removals online and we'll link you over to that on our website at twilighttv.org. Throughout the year, parish farm bureaus across the state host a variety of fundraisers to support the Louisiana Farm Bureau and Ag in the Classroom Foundations, which help to fund the future of Louisiana agricultural leaders. That's why the Terrebonne and Lafouche Parish Farm Bureaus hosted the 12th Louisiana Farm Bureau Fishing Rodeo in early August. 40 participants divided into 12 teams launched from Coco Marina in Cocodree in hopes of bringing back a big fish for a good cause. Prizes were awarded for the top catch in seven categories. Three spec stringer, redfish under 27 inches, redfish with the most spots, drum, sheep's head, flounder and a surprise category for speckled trout. We're here today to raise funds for our Ag in the Classroom and for the Farm Bureau Foundation that supports our scholarship. Two very worthy causes. So all these people have gathered here today. They paid their entrance fee. We have a friendly competition going on. As you'll see in the background, we have the weigh-in going on. Everybody's hoping to have first place. Some will, some won't, but 
Everybody's having a great time and supporting these great causes. Applications for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Linda and Wayne Zonbrecker Scholarships will be available at your local Parish Farm Bureau office in early October. You must pick up the application from the Parish office in order to apply. To find photos from the Louisiana Farm Bureau Fishing Rodeo or to find more information on how to apply for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Linda and Wayne Zonbrecker Scholarships, visit our website at twilatv.org. Well, there's a relatively new way of growing rice in Louisiana. It's called row rice. As Twila's Tammy Arinder shows us, several rice farmers in Northeast Louisiana are partnering with the LSU Ag Center to advance this new technique. Jason Waller has been farming in Northeastern Louisiana his entire life. He's been farming rice in Morehouse Parish for over 20 years. He's now experimenting with a relatively new way to grow the grain. There was um, a 26% water savings on the row rice versus the paddy rice. This rice is flowering and pollinating right now. Waller is partnering with the LSU Ag Center and helping them with research on the non-traditional growing method. It's really become a money saver for us and that's really why we're doing it. You know, farmers really look for different different ways to save money and, and also uh, conservation is a big part. So we're conserving water where uh, we're, we're really it's, it's really good practice. But it's a good alternative crop. Now it's not going to replace paddy rice, regular rice. It's not going to replace that. It's just going to be an alternative for us. Dennis Burns with the LSU Ag Center says row rice farming started several years ago in Missouri and Arkansas. It's just recently caught on in Louisiana. It rotates well on our heavier clays that are irrigated. Works really well. Uh, you have to rotate it because of weed, weed problems. So normally in a paddy rice field, we've got about 7% um, of those acres are in levees. So we're adding that 7% back to the field. We're picking up yield there, but I haven't really seen a, an issue with yield at all. Fits in well in a minimum till situation that we have in Northeast Louisiana on our heavy clays. Burns says there are about 5,000 acres of row rice in the Bayou State and the bulk of that in northeast Louisiana. But he says there could be more converts as the research continues to the row rice as opposed to the paddy rice that you see behind me because of the water savings and the flexibility to rotate with other crops. I'm Tammy Arinder for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture. The LSU Ag Center research is looking at yields on the row rice varieties and when it is best to apply fungicides and fertilizers. Kristen, college students are making their way to campus this week, moving in. So do you miss at all walking amongst the stately oaks at LSU? I have to say, especially this time of year, I miss it a lot mm -hmm. because there wasn't as much responsibility in life. <laughs> there was always people around. You didn't have to adult as much. You don't, yeah, exactly. You don't have to adult as much. But I will have to say that as expensive as college is now compared to when I was there, mm -hmm. I surely don't miss paying for college. And it's really expensive, as I said. If you're thinking about how to pay for college next year, then you should think rice. The National Rice Month Scholarship Video Contest is here, and it's really easy to participate. If you're a high school student in Arkansas, California, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, or Texas, you can submit a three-minute video Video that creates awareness and promotes U.S. grown rice in September National Rice Month and also the importance of rice to your state. Three scholarship prizes are awarded with the grand prize winner receiving $4,000 as well as a trip to the 2019 Rice Outlook Conference for the award ceremony. To learn more about the contest, head on over to our website at twilatv.org. Coming up after the break, I think you're going to show us what's blooming on the bayou, Kristen. That's right, Avery. We'll visit the LSU Ag Center's Botanic Gardens at Burden to learn how to become a better gardener. guys, welcome back to Blooming on the Bayou. And once again, we're at the LSU Ag Center Botanic Gardens at Burden. And this place is a garden lover's dream location. Did you know that the LSU Ag Center has a program that can help you learn more about gardening and give back to your community at the same time? In this month's Blooming on the Bayou, we're gonna learn all about the LSU Ag Center's Master Gardener program. And we're gonna tell you how you can find a location that offers the same program in an area near you. 
Well, joining me now to talk a little bit about the Louisiana Master Gardeners Program is Ms. Mary Tozan. And Mary, you are one of the past presidents of the East Baton Rouge Parish Master Gardeners Association, which is very active and very involved. Tell me a little bit about the background of, of what Master Gardeners is. Master Gardeners started back in 1994. So far there have been about 3,500 Master Gardeners trained in Louisiana. The purpose of the program is to assist the ag centers, the land-grant colleges around the country in providing services, education to the general public. Tell me about some of the educational parts of it that you go through. I noticed we talked about that they're in class right now. Right, and right. And so you learn about from? from Mostly from the professors at LSU, which is wonderful. It's like the stars are uh, giving you the uh, content of their most recent research. And there's specialists in each area. I never knew that there was a specialist in grass, for right. instance, uh, in insects, ornamentals, vegetables, soil, all sorts of different things. that each of the LSU professors specialize in. Professors as well as other people come in and discuss their particular specific content area. So you learn a great deal in the class, but that's just the beginning. That just scratches the surface. You really learn once you start implementing. So in addition to the paid staff at the Ag Center, we volunteers have been trained to, with research-based information to go out and supplement the work of the uh, county agents. Once a person goes through the training, the volunteer, the student, commits to 40 hours of volunteer work in the first year and then 20 hours of volunteer work thereafter to remain a, an active Master Gardener. Okay, so when we talk about all of the volunteer activities that you're required to do as part of the Master Gardener program, tell me about some of the different areas in the community that you guys go out and serve. We will go out to uh, schools and manage school gardens. We have a library series of uh, many of our master gardeners will do short presentations and there's usually two a night for the general public. In addition to that, we do plant health clinics. Those every um, first Saturday at the farmer's market downtown. We'll do a plant health clinic and then at various uh, nurseries where our people will go sit at a booth and it's an opportunity for the public to bring in their broken plants, their diseased their plants, plants, their yellow plants, right, whatever, or just any questions and we'll, we have our plethora of research as well as trained staff who will help them figure out. Every volunteer activity is not only a service, but it's an additional learning opportunity. That's so it. the more we do, the more we learn. Well, you sound like that you're extremely passionate about this program. How did you get started in this? Oh my goodness, that's a good story. I, after I retired, I took the class at La House. My purpose was to learn how to quit killing my plants. And Dan Gill, who is a wonderful, wonderful um, horticulturist, got up in front of the class and said, if you're not killing plants, you're not gardening. So the biggest lesson I learned is just accept it. It's going to happen. But we still, of course, want as much knowledge as we possibly can to reduce that. But it's, it is a natural part of plant life. I love that <laughs> quote because that is true. You're not doing anything if you're not it's part of life. It is. It's part of life. We're going to take a short break, but when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the other benefits of the Master Gardens program, including y'all's plant sale, which is a big fundraiser. So stay with us. Welcome back to Blooming on the Bayou and we're at the Botanic Gardens here at the Burden Center and I have another special guest with the Master Gardener program, that's Kathy Mayer and Kathy, you're in charge of the plant cell which is a big program for the East Baton Rouge Parish Gardeners. Tell me all about it. Well, the uh, program's been going on a long time. The plant cell started way before I got here and it will end way after I am here. And uh, it's been going on for as long as we've had master gardeners out here. You can talk to some of our more experienced gardeners who've been with us a very long time, and they will tell you that they had these plant sales in their own homes before they actually moved out to Burden. And basically it's to raise funds for all of our programs in the community. Every year we put on this plant sale, it's ended up to be a huge endeavor. 
I mean, by the time we start usually in early fall, like around at the end of September, beginning of October, and we go six months until we have the plant sale. And in that time, we are raising plants, taking cuttings, getting them in misting, rooting them, putting them out on the shade yard, then into the greenhouses to keep them warm enough. And it is just one huge work effort on part of all of our master gardeners. And we do very well. The plant sale is a huge money maker. And the people in the community seem to love it. They look forward to this plant sale because you're going to get plants you can't find in the nurseries. Right. You're going to get plants that are kind of rare. You're going to get plants that you know will do good here because they are growing here. They're growing right here at Bird and Gardens and they just tend to acclimate a lot better to the climate. You mentioned that you guys start in October. It's not something that you go pick up some plants from a wholesaler and you sell them in March. Tell, right. Tell, tell me about right. how it's an educational thing for the people that are involved in Master Gardeners too. Well, what's really great about it is you start with these little cuttings off of plants and then you stick them in soil and they go into misting until they start forming their little roots and then as they get big enough we bump them as we call it to a little bigger container and then they get bumped again to another container and the reason that it's so educational is because you can take classes until you're blue in the face but that is way different from actually doing the process and learning I mean it is just a complete difference and I've learned so much because it seems just like children each plant has its own way of wanting to grow so the same they don't require all the same things some like a little drier some like a little wetter some don't like misting at all they want to just be out on the shade yard and just let them do their own thing and you learn that through the years what I love about it is the people I mean, you can do all the plants in the world you want, but if you don't have those wonderful people around you, it's, that is what's exciting. And I've met so many great master gardeners. That was going to be my next question. You must have been <laughs> able to read my mind, is what was your favorite part of it? And so you like dealing with the, the people as you're growing the plants and, and, and creating a product to sell right. to customers. Right. I like the people. And that's what keeps me being a master gardener because you meet some of the most wonderful people you've ever met in your life. They are very generous of spirit. They have a great uh, empathy for others and they want to do whatever they can to help you. Uh, this is not something you find everywhere. So it's really great. So, well, we've missed the plant sale for this year, but tell me about when the 2020 plant sale will be. It's next March, March 21st. So mark it on your calendars now. Plenty of people already have, so. <laughs> okay, and if you're interested in joining the Master Gardener program, we put a link on our website, twilighttv.org, to where we'll give you all the information and information on the plant sale. And you can also, you guys have a Facebook page, correct? Yes, East Baton Rouge Master Gardener's Facebook. And there's also a Louisiana Master Gardener's Facebook okay. page. Well, thank you, Mary, thank you, Kathy, for giving us all of this information. You guys have a wonderful program. Thank you so much for sharing this with Blooming on the Bayou. We'll see you next time on Blooming on the Bayou. Again, to learn more about the Master Gardener program, visit our website at twilighttv.org. And while you're there, let us know what you'd like to see featured on next month's Blooming on the Bayou. Looks like y'all had a good bit of fun out there. It did, and it's a great program. If I wish I had some extra time to participate in it. Yeah, the Master Gardener program can be a little intense. It, it's, it's very, you learn a lot. And mm -hmm. It's a lot of community service hours that go into it, so, but it's a great program. Well, that does it for this edition of Twyla. Be sure to join us next week when we'll take a look at how all this wet weather is affecting harvest for most crops and planting for sugarcane. Until then, you can watch all of our stories online at twilatv.org and be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. We post all of our stories there. For all of us here at Twyla, thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again right here next week.